And welcome all to this Good Friday service. We are glad that you are here, no matter whom you happen to love, no matter where you're from, no matter what your spiritual tradition may or may not be. This is a place that is open for all and welcomes all of who you are. Uh, St. Andrews Wesley strives to be a community of faith that is open-minded, open-hearted, and follows in the path of Jesus that we might work together to further the, uh, the spirit of justice and peace in the world that flows from Christ. And we come together on this Good Friday for one of uh, the most real services of the year. It's when we're in touch with both an event that is singular and plural. Singular in that uh, we remember, of course, that one event where Jesus, an innocent person, was tortured and killed on the cross, and how his presence changed the course of history. We mark time, uh, at least in the Western world, we mark time by his, his birth before and after. And we also come together on this day to recognize how Good Friday is not only singular but also plural because unfortunately there is innocence that is uh, violently killed, extinguished, uh, violated uh, around the world every day. And we come together and remember how that continues to happen despite all our best efforts. We come together to be mindful of how we too, in ways that we are aware of, in ways that we are unaware of, how we share in the complicity of this system. And so, welcome to this service of reality, where we find ourselves opened up just as we are in the, uh, in the texture of the world and allow the Spirit of God to breathe through us even still. Uh, I'd like to thank Peggy Waugh and the choir, the ensemble, for your leadership in the service, for the readers, for your contributions in the service. Um, Angelique, of course. And uh, we remember every time we gather that we do so on the unceded and the tr traditional territories of the Skohomish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And even as we remember that, that is one of the ways in which we are taking account of our complicity of injustices that have happened in the past and carry on into today. And so embraced by the spirit of God's mercy, which fortunately is deeper and broader than all of our injustices, welcome as we move into the service. Let's take a breath. And simply allow the sacredness of this place to fall into you as we allow ourselves to be gathered in the Spirit of Christ, in tune with the beauty of the world and the harsh realities of the world. In tune with the Spirit of Christ that breathes through each one of us. In your embrace, O oh God, we open ourselves to you now. Amen. And as you're able, I invite you to rise as we sing our opening hymn, O oh, Come and Mourn with Me a While.
the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 21 to 20, uh, 12 to 21. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do we want us to go and make the preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and whenever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a guest room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. So the disciples set out to and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when, he, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and said to him, one after another, Surely not I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Mark 14, verses 32 to 42. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into a time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying again the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. <clears throat> Mark 14, verses 53 to 65. <clears throat> Excuse me. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with guards, warming himself at the fire. 
Now the chief priests and the whole council we are looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, have you no answer? What is it that they are testing? Sorry. What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do, you st Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him and strike him, saying to him, profess, the guards also took him over and beat him. Friends, please rise and join our voices in song.
Friends, let us pray. As we journey towards the cross today, it is so easy to turn away. But may we together bear the suffering of the world so that hope may spring forth again. Amen. There are a lot of lines and imagery in Good Friday scripture, but the one that always gets me is this one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus utters this in his final moments, and I find it always jars me. It makes me wonder if you've ever hit rock bottom. I don't mean if you've had troubles or disappointments in your life, we've, we've all had those. I mean, have you ever gotten to a place where you are completely out of options? Where you can't go any further in any direction? Where pain is the only reality? Where there is nowhere but right here? Sometimes rock bottom happens because of choices that we've made, but more often than not, it's likely that it's just been sprung on us and that what stares us in the face is the limitation of our own power and control over our own life. If you have faced addiction and been in recovery, you may know what this particular landscape looks like. Or if you've been trapped in the grip of mental illness, then you know a little bit what Jesus might have meant when he cried out. And if you've lost a child, then you know intimately every crack and every crevice of what rock bottom looks like. It's the rawest and most frightening of experiences. Spiritually, it is the most desolate and toughest because most of the time in our life, we have some wiggle room. We can escape. We can distract ourselves. We can find another route. It's rarely this stark, but when it does happen, when all options are gone, when the stretches between us are just uncertainty and pain, then what? Part of what makes rock bottom so frightening is we feel so alone in the experience so abandoned. After following Jesus's life since Advent, we too arrive with Jesus at rock bottom on Good Friday where there is nowhere to turn. And we stand before the scandal and the shame and the injustice of the cross, confused and worried. After all, Jesus's whole life has been dedicated to God. He has healed and taught and given of himself for the saving of the world, for the good of all, and somehow we still end up here? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I will, I'll admit it, this line actually angers me a little bit because surely now, in the most vulnerable of moments, surely now, the presence of God should be most felt by Jesus. Why would God abandon him now? And the profound loneliness of that moment haunts us and makes us ask, when we need God the most, will God not be there? I still actually can't tell what is more terrifying, the idea that there may not be a God or that God is the kind of presence who would abandon us in our darkest hours. And as we collectively face climate change, the refugee crisis and global conflict, we silently and secretly wonder, will we be abandoned by God too? Left to our collective sins and mistakes, are we really in this alone? Good Friday forces us to confront this stark reality and it's difficult. And we do try, we try to turn towards the cross or towards the tragedy in the West Bank in Gaza or towards the lack of housing for our children, or towards the planet's fires and droughts and floods, and we get overwhelmed and want to run, who would want 
to stand beside the cross? Who would want to confront genocide or species death or mental health spiraling out of control in our streets, particularly when we can't be guaranteed that facing it will do anything at all? What if no answers come? My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? On Good Friday, we want some comfort, some assurance that God is still with Jesus, still with us, even when things hit rock bottom. So as we journey through the scripture following, we might listen carefully for some assurance. And there are a few possible signs that God too is right near the cross. As soon as Jesus breathes his last breath, the line speaks of the temple curtain being torn into. And this is a symbolic image because in the temple in that time, the veil was used to show the separation between God and the people. The sacred was behind the curtain and the rest of us were out here. In the religious tradition of that time, contact with God was mediated. We were separated. Only the priests and the rabbis could go behind the curtain. But on Jesus' death, that separation ends. And we are meant to know that in no way are we ever apart from God. We know that the centurion reacts with that reality as he witnesses Jesus breathing his last breath, saying, truly, this man was God's son. Then there are the words that Jesus cries out himself, the ones that I've been repeating, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the opening lines to Psalm 22, which is a piece of writing about being at the rock bottom. In 31 verses, most of the time, the writer is pouring out every single fear they have as they search for God in dark times. But the psalm also contains the kernels of hope that God is still here even in the worst of situations, saying, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. So maybe as Jesus utters those lines, despite being at rock bottom, he is praying with the hope that no matter how bleak it looks, all is not hopeless that no matter what, God is with him too. And the temple veil tears, and the centurion cries out, this is God in human form. This is God most intimate. This is God here, even here. Maybe you find that a bit of uneasy comfort, because no matter what, I think on Good Friday, we are invited to take a leap of faith. As we stand by the cross today and in scripture, we know the story that comes next. We know God doesn't abandon us, but ends all separation and then brings us to the miracle of resurrection. When we stand by the cross of the world today, we are understandably less sure and so we are left to hope and trust in God, even though we don't know what will solve the ache of the world, the complex problems, or even what we need to do to change ourselves. We hit rock bottom. But we notice that the curtain of the temple has already been torn in two. Jesus has ended the separation between us and God forever. We are not, in fact, alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace. That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. They clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. Let the Messiah the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard, heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem.
As the women gathered by the cross, they lay their burdens down. They sat with the body of Jesus. We're inviting you now to a ritual where you will take that little piece of paper that was offered to you when you first came in to write down something you are grieving for, a place where you need prayer, and to come up and to tuck that into the cross. If you don't have paper, not to worry. Our ushers, Robert and Nick, have some. And they will guide you in terms of which rows can go. This is a beautiful opportunity to just be with. If you would like to receive hands-on prayer in that moment, both Jen and Kurt are in the transepts here and are very happy to pray with you. As we enter into this space, allow the music to wash over you and to bring your breath and your attention and your heart to this moment.
with the prayers of our heart woven into the cross, with our gathered prayers of the people, we continue in prayer. Holy One, we turn now to you, you who hold in your heart all our grief, all our suffering. This Friday, the good seems so far away. Even still with spring blooming around us, we pause and turn to you as we gather around the shadow of the cross, the symbol of innocent suffering in the world. This is not where we would choose to be, O oh God. Brought face to face with a symbol of death and instrument of torture. Forgive us when we turn our backs and try to avoid the suffering of another or our own. Help us realize once again that this is also where we find you sometimes most powerfully and truthfully when we are broken open by the pain of the world. Help us in the gritty reality of life, in the disappointments and the hardness of rock bottom, to reach out to you, open to you. Trust that despite the silence, you are still there. You know the ways of the world, O oh God. You have been here. You are here. With us, you have loved and cried, lived and died. With us, you offer comfort. Even still, you forgive us. Breathe peace upon us. You free us. For this, we give thanks. This, we call good. And so with Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we join our voice in the prayer of our tradition. Our mother, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you to remain seated as we sing our closing hymn, when I sur What Wondrous Love Is This? When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
when evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. Today you're invited to stay as long as you would like in prayer, reflection, and you're also, when the time is right, invited to leave in silence. <laughs> 